Throughout history, every culture and age has told stories of hauntings, visitations from beyond the grave. Whatever your beliefs, what cannot be denied is that the living are outnumbered by the dead. The tales you're about to witness are created from first-hand accounts. They portray the experiences of people who had no more reason to believe in ghosts than you. Is it possible that beyond our understanding there exists a darker world? The early hours of a summer night, 1999. Deep in the Sussex countryside stands Mitchellum Priory. Once the dwelling place of an order of monks on a site that is over 700 years old. dark events led this man to feeling under siege in his own home. Only two weeks earlier, Chris Tuckett had first taken residence at Mitchellum Priory in his new role as property manager. For me, it was a, it was a big break. Um, I've been on building sites for some years before I came here. Um, it was an opportunity for me to, to get a career, a sustainable career, uh, and I was really excited at the prospect of working in such a place as this. You're pretty much in awe of, of your surroundings. You literally walk through the gatehouse and you see it, and it, the majestic side of it is just fantastic. The views, the gardens. It just looked like an idealistic place to be, really. Yet, as early as his first night in the building, Chris began to think that perhaps all was not as it seemed. As the only resident in the Priory, he had to set a complex system of security alarms as he locked up for the night. I thought I'd, I'd lock someone in. If a door opens, I, I, I know. Um, if anyone comes in the house, once that alarm's been set, then I, I, I know anyone coming in. Each time Chris thought he had found the source of the woman crying, he felt the sound came from elsewhere. But after checking every room and alarm, he realized that the house was empty. Although unsettled by the harrowing episode, for Chris, it was merely the beginning of his experiences at the Priory.
quickly as it came, it went. And it's not like it just stopped. It physically, you could hear it coming. It came into the room and it was gone again. Chris was not the only person to believe that there were strange happenings at Mitchellum. His predecessor also felt he had been targeted by unseen forces. Outside, it was a, it was a beautiful evening. Then also we had this terrific roar, you know, like a, a train or a plane. And it just got louder and louder, and I went to the window to look out, you know, what is it? And next minute, it just only it swooped, it came up through the house, through the flat. Wow. Something had gone through the house, and it was gone. The house has always been in command. We've got hundreds of years of history, of day-to-day -day living in this place, like we've got today. Nobody can tell me that there's not a presence at Mitchell and Priory, because there is. Fred came to believe that whatever resides in the Priory could strike out at anyone trying to settle there. It's their way of saying, we're here. And if things happen in their house, they react by, they don't like it. When I first moved in, the flat was unfurnished. Chris decided to turn an empty room at the top of the house into his living quarters. It was then that he felt that a presence was finally trying to drive him out. To be perfectly honest with you, I was terrified. Once you've established that you are actually awake, and this is really happening, uh, very, very quickly, your, your mind uh, is overwhelmed by, by, by fear. it just moved two or three feet away from the wall where it's placed. I still can't believe I, I found myself in that situation. It was pure hell. was the last call for me. I was desperate.
it did wear me down. The only way I could deal with it, and the way I did deal with it in the end, was to sit at the bottom of the stairs of the main house, and I found myself talking to a property, trying to make whoever it is here not feel threatened. But I wasn't going to change anything dramatically or drastically, and actually I was here to try and maintain and look after the place rather than being a threat. If, if that particular evening hadn't taken place, I'm sure I wouldn't be here now. Since that night, Chris has come to terms with life at the Priory, but he remains forever on his guard. It's a situation where I don't really want to know the ins and outs of whys and the wherefores. I'm here for a blink in time, and I, I am I'm just irrelevant in, in, a, in a scale of things, really, and I am here just for a blink. After all, it's their house, and I'm just a guest. Is it perhaps possible that buildings are not mere bricks and mortar, that they can somehow carry the dark traces of an unseen world? The Isle of Wight, three miles from mainland Britain, atop a hill in the northern coastal town of Ryde, sits a Victorian building. For decades, residents say they've been terrorised there. Nothing would induce me to go back and live there now. To actually spend the night in the place, I don't really know what we were thinking about, to be honest. I mean, it just frightens the life out of me to think about it. My stomach churns at the thought of what went on there. The building, to me, is alive. It's got evil. And I think there's something buried in there. John and Margaret Oakley moved in to the top floor flat of the converted Victorian house, and at first, nothing suggested the events that would unfold. It was a gradual thing, to be quite honest. The, the, it wasn't really until some major situations occurred that I came to realise there was something not quite right. There's something outside yourself that um, seemed to be there. Something in the darkness that you can't see and you don't know what it is. We were asleep in the bedroom about two o'clock in the morning. It was oppressive. I was paralysed with fear. I was frightened to put my hand into the bed to put the light on, for wondering what I was going to see. It stopped immediately. You flooded the room with light. And it's even greater shock, really, to see that there wasn't anything there. Which was even worse, you know, because you can't defend yourself against nothing. After that, I searched that flat. I looked up the chimney, I looked behind everything, and I even went up in the roof, and I couldn't see a thing. I, I don't want to go down that road where those wings came from. That was from a very dark place indeed. I knew after that that the force in that building was evil. The whole atmosphere of the place was so bad, I didn't want to stay. Days later, the Oakleys fled the flat. Sometime afterwards, Dean and Georgina Rogers became tenants. I, I, I don't know what they were. I, I don't pretend to know what ghosts are, but they were present in that building. 
and Georgina believes one, a female presence, began to focus on a particular member of the Rogers family. Everything I did with my son in the flat was being watched by her. It felt like she was present behind me every time I bathed him, every time I dressed him, every time I changed his nappy, every time I fed him. When she entered the room, as soon as she entered the room, whether she opened the door to enter or whether she came through the wall, you would know straight away that she was there. Her, her presence was better felt than the presence of a living person in the room. When Connor would wake in the night and, and cry, um, me and Dean would wait because sometimes she would go to him and shush him back to sleep. And we would, we would actually hear her over the cot. Me and Connor were in the flat one day on our own. And he was playing up. And I lost my temper with him and shouted. Something that she regrets. At that point, I felt threatened and scared that she would have the power to do that. Nevertheless, Georgina felt something far worse lay elsewhere in the house. It seemed that the further you went down in the building, the, the more evil it felt. Ed Payne and his wife were the occupants of the ground floor flat. We thought that we were being looked at, not just on the outside, but inside. And it was a terrible, terrible feeling that someone was scrutinizing you all the time, and you couldn't see it, and it was a real, deep oppressiveness. When I put my head on the pillow to go to sleep, I heard a banging noise. And it was like it was coming from an inside wall, someone trying to get out. A couple of nights later, put our head down to go to sleep, and all of a sudden, I heard a baby crying. And it was in our bedroom. And I got up from the bed and I walked to the uh, wardrobe where I thought the noise was coming from. When I neared the wardrobe, the baby stopped crying. I had to open the wardrobe, because I just had to find it. When I put my hand on the linen on the left-hand side, the linen was quite warm, as though a baby was lying on it. When I put my hand on the right-hand side, it was normally cold. I knew where the saints were coming from. They were distinctive. Whatever was in there was it's playing games with you. But if something was playing games with him, the games were about to become more terrifying. I went up to the hallway. I saw a black mass. It was though you were being attacked, and I tell you, I was scared. I was frightened at my wits. It looked evil. Obviously, I couldn't tell my wife. I didn't want to alarm her. It 
was a few days after that that my wife said to me, Ed, I've got something to tell you. She said, Ed, she said, I'm scared. I saw a black mass, just a few inches from the grain. It just looked evil. I can't go on. I just can't say no more about it because I'm getting upset. <laughs> Ed's wife died four years later. To this day, he feels her death could be linked to their stay in the house. Stretching over 20,000 miles, through cityscapes and countryside to some of the most deserted and dark corners of the country are Britain's railways. Yet, stories told of this remote, forest-shrouded train crossing at Naworth, Cumbria, suggest it may not be just the living travelling along them. When you're talking to the locals, you discover this fear of going to Naworth at night, and level-minded people saying they would never pass that area at night because of the creepy atmosphere. I'm not a soft guy. I've been on the railway coming up for 30 years. I've also done tours of Northern Ireland when I was in the army, and I wasn't scared. But working it now within that wood, I was terrified. For signalman Dennis Simpson, what began as a normal night shift was to change his life forever. We used to go to Narwith when the engineers were working on the line. Stationed in this signal box in the dead of night, Dennis would have to walk up the track and lower the barriers to let trains pass the crossing. It's like a place in the middle of nowhere. The trees hanging over, wind blowing, and it is very, very, very weary place to go to. There's no lights or nothing. The telephone rang. I answered it. And the signal in the lower row said, there's a train coming. It's just left me now. Silence and darkness, that's all it was. And all of a sudden, just halfway up the track to the crossing. <laughs> my, my whole body, like, tingled, went cold. And I was actually shaking. The sound was children crying. For their mother or father. I was scared. And it was a horrible, horrible sound. That's when I ran to the crossing to lower the barriers. Terrifying, terrifying. I actually ran back to the signal box and locked the door. And I had to sit there in that box and I was hoping there'd be no more trains to save us going back out. Dennis refused to work the crossing again. But he would not be alone in believing that the woods held a dark secret. One night, Signalman Colin Metcalf headed to Naworth. I'd heard of rumours of Naworth being spooky and eerie, and I took it just to be as nonsense until the night I actually drove down. Rather than wait in the signal box surrounded by forest, Colin parked his car at the crossing, 
waiting for the trains to come. I noticed there was these lights kept appearing over on the wood on the far side of the railway and they were appearing and disappearing in a U-turn and I was trying to fathom out actually what the lights were for. I was wondering why it all of a sudden started barking. sitting with fear then. And then the figure spoke, could I have a light please? I looked for my lighter in the car. There was no figure there at all, it disappeared. I was absolutely petrified. Had no time to walk away from the car, walk to the woods, or walk in front of the car. No way. I know what I've seen. There was a figure there, and then there wasn't a figure there. After alerting headquarters, Colin raced from Naworth. Still troubled by his experience and looking for answers, Dennis Simpson turned to local historian Robert French. It was August the 30th, 1926. It was at 1.18 in the afternoon. The weather was clear. Everything was perfect. There was a, a char bank, which was the early form of transport, early form of buses, was going on a pleasure trip, and it had to pass by now worth level crossing. A new signalman had taken the job seven days earlier, a Mr Oliver. Yet, as the signalman opened the gate for the Sharabang to cross the tracks, the trip turned to horror as a train sped towards it. The train was doing about 50 miles an hour when the collision occurred. The incident was of obviously horrendous nature when eight local people died. Of the eight killed, four members of the same family were among the dead a Mrs. Campbell, her sister-in-law, and her two children. And one final chilling detail would offer no peace to Colin Metcalf and Dennis Simpson. This is the wood where they laid the bodies, just down there. And it still haunts me to this day. I wouldn't like to go back again anyways. And I didn't go back from that night anyways. I totally refused to go back. I know there were two children crying and they were ghosts. Flintshire, North East Wales. A land filled with dark and mysterious tales of spirits and hauntings finds perhaps its most chilling in the foreboding confines of a 17th century Jacobean mansion. Plasteg. Plasteg was originally built in 1610 by Sir John Trevor. And Plasteg means fair house, fair mansion. But I think uh, you, know, you could look at the the house's history over the centuries, and it's got anything but a fair history. It's dark, it's gruesome, it's full of bloodthirsty deeds and sorrowful events. You have to remember that when Plasteg was built, we're living in the age of witchcraft, when there was a great battle going on between the forces of Christian religion and the much darker, older pagan beliefs. It's noticeable in this house that Sir John Trevor, as far as we know, had a witch sign carved on the fireplace in the Great Hall. And this was designed to prevent evil spirits from coming in down the chimney. Now, looking at the history of the house, 
Clearly it was one of those symbols that really didn't work. Yet for one man, unaware of the house's history, the offer of lodging in Plasteg with the mansion owner while he did some work there was one he found too tempting to resist. Our family business at the time was accountancy and we handled the books for Plasteg. Within a couple of days of moving in, I just woke up in the middle of the night. The sound was as if 20 or 30 people were stamping, thundering up and down on the floor above. It's just shock and great confusion. I mean, I knew there was just the two of us there in the house. But within a matter of days, Mark would become convinced that it was not just he and the owner that walked the mansion. But now, it was not just Mark Ridgway who felt he was experiencing strange events. They were also reported on the road outside the mansion. I worked the area around Plasteg Hall for about 15 years, and on a regular basis I used to get telephone calls and callers at the police station saying there was a woman walking along the dual carriageway near Plasteg. I found it strange that every time I went there, I couldn't find anything. I recall one instance where a young lady reported having struck a pedestrian on the road outside Plasteg Hall, which resulted in the force sending out a helicopter and a search dog to look for a casualty. The driver claimed that after she hit the woman pedestrian, she could see no sign of the victim. The police, with a helicopter team surveying the road and nearby fields, could also find no trace. Mark Ridgway was facing his last night in Plasteg. It's as if somebody's face was right in my face. It was, it was there. Mark left the mansion, never to return. But there were still reports of strange happenings on the road outside Plasteg. A number of cars had crashed coming off the dual carriageway with no other vehicles involved. It was about um, half past 10. I was on my way to Wrexham to meet a friend. 
and as I was driving hit the brakes and skidded the car it's like a thud and I just sat there absolutely petrified Half of me wanted to get out and look, but the other half of me, I just remember having my hands on the steering wheel and my, my knuckles were white. It's just an awful feeling to think that you kill somebody. police officer knocked on my window. He asked me was I all right and I said, I, I said no I wasn't. You know, I said I think I've hit somebody, a girl, and could he go and look for me? The police officer came back and he said there's no one there. I just thought, well there's got to be. Well, there's got to be somebody there. I didn't think they believed me actually, that I'd actually seen somebody until I described what the lady looked like. And he said, uh, well, haven't you heard, what, uh, about the ghost? Could Plasteg's dark history hold the key to the sightings on the nearby road? So John Trevor had a daughter, Dorothy, and as was common then, rich families would try to marry into rich families. And he had somebody lined up, a sort of nobleman with a you know, good estate in Cheshire. Yet Dorothy did not agree with her father's plans for marriage and plotted to run away with her true love, a local farmer's son. Now, a week before they eloped, Dorothy took some family jewels and hid them in the well nearby to the house. Dorothy and her lover arranged to make their escape under the cover of night. But first, she walked alone to retrieve the hidden jewellery that would fund their future happiness. She made her way to the well in the dark, and because she obviously couldn't show a light in case someone saw where she was going, she couldn't find the hiding place. And in her panic to find them, slipped and fell d down the well. As Dorothy lay in darkness, her distraught lover thought that he had been jilted. The farmer's son hung himself from the tree where they'd arranged to meet and barely two days later, Dorothy's body was finally recovered from the well where she died. Does local folklore offer too convenient an explanation that the figure seen by drivers is the ghost of the tragic daughter? Perhaps, but consider this, the route that would have reunited the lovers cuts across the road. Mid 19th century Britain, Swindon Railway Works, where thousands of men would risk their lives in brutal and dangerous conditions, toiling to build transport for a new age. It's hammer shops, such things as that, you know. Rolling mill, all the hot, red hot steel coming round. There was shunting going on, and people got crushed with the shunting or injured, maimed. Oh, it's a dangerous place to work in. So many people got killed on this railway workshops. When the works closed in 1986, security men were stationed to patrol the vast semi derelict site. I used to go around to do the rounds, and all you had was a hand torch. You're walking around, and the building is breathing, and you hear the creep, the cracks going on, and it's spooky. Ghostly, very haunted place. There was one place I used to hate going in, and that was Nine Shop. 
I always thought there was something there. And the guards soon began to feel that they were not alone. seemed to disappear right in front of their eyes. Nothing there at all. They more or less broke down in fear. After the apparent disappearance of the figure, many guards were too fearful to work the site. We had blokes come on the job and we took them round and showed them what to do, but as soon as they had to go on their own, that was it, they come off the job. They just said, well, we don't want that, it's too frightening. One bloke, I always remember, he went out for an hour and he come back, he said, that's it. He went home and finished. He, he just couldn't stand it. He was frightened. But one night watchman who remained believes he came face to face with the figure they say haunts the works. I couldn't tell you that this night was any particular, uh, in any way different to any other night. Until, um, you know, until it kind of all happened. Well, I was coming towards the end of that patrol. And as he was coming down the stairwell, I caught a movement at the corner of my eye. He saw a figure. This figure was looking into the inside of this clock. And he challenged him. And as he did so, it wasn't even so he vanished, he just suddenly wasn't there anymore. Is it possible the figure could have been a ghostly echo of the railway works past? It is certain that the clock was one that Great Western Railway trains set their timetable to. And over the years, it would have been the duty of various workers to make sure the clocks were in working order. The way Steve described him, it was the man that used to look out at his two big master timepieces we had in the works. There's no other explanation. Nobody could have got in there because the doors were locked both sides. 